Okay, so um, welcome to 2017 Lunch and Learn webinar series. This is one of many webinars that we've been offering um, in the fall semester, and we will continue into uh, 2018. So the title of today's uh, webinar is an open discussion uh, surrounding the idea of digital humanities and teaching online. And it's hosted by the Office of Online Learning. A few things I'd like to mention uh, as we begin is that this webinar is now being recorded. Uh, we will be sending a link to everyone um, who's attended today with some additional resources after the webinar has ended. So at some point, please put your email address in the chat feature. Um, if you would like to receive more information. Um, you are not required to speak as a participant through um, your microphone or use your webcam, although if you would like to um, ask a question later, you're more than welcome to. Um, we will have time for questions throughout the presentation. Um, uh, is mostly at the end, uh, at that time, please use uh, ask us any questions that you would like using the chat feature, and we will facilitate it that way. Um, I do want to mention from uh, the beginning here that uh, this is a slightly different format webinar than we've given in in the past, where. Uh, in the past, we've had several uh, PowerPoint presentation slides, and we've gone through each of them um, sort of systematically and had a conversation around it, or it's been sort of maybe one-dimensional where one person is talking. This is a little bit of, of a different situation in terms of it being more of an open discussion among several people. Um, what I do want to mention is there's a little bit of an issue with a time lag, which we have not experienced before, although we're all in, wired in. Um, so I'd ask everyone um, in today's session to just be conscious of that. If there happens to be a slight time lag, you can always use um, the chat feature to speak. But um, I think all of the presenters know at this point that there's a little bit of, of a time lag, um, and we're, we're conscious of it. So before I uh, get into the meat of uh, this topic of digital humanities and teaching online, I do want to um, introduce the folks that will be talking today um, and ask them uh, to tell us a little bit about themselves in terms of uh, what courses you teach at the Mount, perhaps maybe how long you've been teaching here at the Mount and your sort of area of expertise. And I'll start off with myself in, in not a great, uh, great amount of detail. I'm the director of online learning. Um, and I have asked Kaylin, Kinney, and Nihal to uh, join me because we've been working closely together over the last few years on courses that they've been teaching in the hybrid or online format. And we have a good working relationship. And there's some interesting things that you they've been doing um, that I thought I would sort of bring to light and then um, link that to a more open conversation about uh, teaching online and and the types of content that they teach. So um, I would ask if Kaylin, if you could introduce yourself first, and then I'll ask Nihal if you can introduce yourself second. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylin. Um, I've been an adjunct professor of music at Mount St. Mary since 2001, and I've been teaching online since 2003. You might have seen me accompanying the choir at concerts, singing at Vespers, that type of thing. <laughs> um, I started at the Mount teaching in-person courses like instrumental ensemble and various music history courses. So I taught intro to music, which is just the Western European tradition, Bach, Beethoven, and the boys. And I also taught romantic music in the same Western style. Um, I proposed teaching Intro to Music online, and I was the first person in the Division of Arts and Letters to teach anything online. And then I proposed and wrote and developed many other online courses like American Music and Music and Film and The History of Rock and Roll and Jazz Appreciation. So when I began teaching online at the Mount, there was um, one, one person in one office in Hudson Hall, 
and my students were required to come to a mandatory in-person meeting on the first day of the online class. <laughs> um, and that was just so that we could meet each other and figure out um, a little bit about the workings of the online system and how we were going to communicate with each other and how to where, how to post assignments. And so there weren't any tutorials and there wasn't there certainly wasn't an entire tech team to help with online students. So I'll uh, give it to Nihal for now. Um, well, I'm Nihal, and I've been teaching here since uh, 2006. I uh, started teaching uh, digital photography. And I think we have lost Kim. And I come <laughs> from the industry. I have worked uh, as a commercial photographer for almost uh, 35 years. Uh, I studied in Germany and in the United States uh, photography and photo technology. So, base, uh, so um, the, uh, the classes at Mount St. Mary College, I didn't start teaching uh, uh, or supplementing my classes with uh, online instructions uh, until about six years ago. That's after, after almost five years after I had uh, started teaching here. And to, that has been, we may have to and I have anyone. embraced it um, ever since. Nihal, would I, you like to um, tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, about myself? Uh, Christian, can you hear me? Uh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, so I, I was just uh, uh, the last sentence I said was that that uh, I, I use. Um, uh, online teaching for both my classes, history of photography and photography. And they, uh, uh, they are two slightly different uh, formats. Uh, in photography, I use e-class as a valuable tool to enhance the quality of my instruction. Uh, for example, I post my day's lesson notes, links, videos, and samples online for the students to have a clear idea as to what's happening. Um, before, during, uh, or after class, students have the opportunity to review the notes, material, and ask questions. Um, this is uh, mostly in addition to the face-to-face -face instructions um, I, uh, I give the class. Uh, and uh, since it's an art form, uh, uh, photography, uh, there are different ways of reaching a goal. And students always ask why I suggest one way and not the other. And I need to have a very convincing answer to that. And that's where the experience that I have as a commercial photographer in the industry uh, comes handy. I could give them uh, the specific uh, examples as to why I plan on doing certain things certain way, ways. Um, and I can also post uh, the, those reasons uh, uh, in my notes, say, please don't do it this way, do it that uh, the other way. And uh, students, my assignments are posted uh, uh, online. And when students uh, uh, go to complete their assignments, indoors or outdoors, they can always re use their smartphone uh, or the laptop. Uh, in uh, this day and age, mostly the smartphone to uh, go through the instructions or the uh, assignment uh, uh, specifications one more uh, time to uh, execute the assignment as uh, uh, precisely as uh, needed. Um, and I also open a forum for the students to share their work and discuss techniques and other useful information uh, that they like to share. Uh, this doesn't happen very often for the intro class until the middle part uh, of the semester, uh, because that's when they have uh, their techniques, their confidence, um, all the, uh, well synchronized. Um, class participation in my classes uh, play an important role. In their final grade, that's like about 20 to 30%. So. Uh, uh, 
participating in uh, online discussions uh, or the forum plays an important role um, for my students. So the online uh, the class uh, has all the bells and whistles or the tools uh, for me to make it happen. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's okay. thank, thank you, Nihal. Well um, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let let me just uh, bridge this conversation regarding digital humanities and and teaching online a, a little bit further. Um, with a little bit of background and context, and then, um, as we discussed, I'll I'll ask a couple open-ended questions, and we can have um, a, a broader discussion about this. So, um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the title itself, which is Digital Humanities and Teaching Online, which I'll say uh, in the um, onset that this could have been titled many different things, and I'll. I'll tell you later on why I chose this particular title. Um, if you were just to do a general Google search of digital humanities, um, to see a definition, what you would find typically is something along the lines of it being an area of scholarly um, activity that intersects computing and information technology with the humanities. And the humanities being art, music, literature, language, geography, philosophy, and some others. Um, so really what digital humanities does is brings, to, brings together technology and, um, and those fields I just mentioned. But um, we could bridge, we, we could sort of take that, um, take that understanding or definition a little bit further. We can go really broad with it, or we can be very narrow. Um, and what you'll see, um, again, through other resources is that digital humanities can also mean visual, visual, visualization or data design, curation, uh, um, gaming, coding, software applications, et cetera. Those are sort of like the larger um, topics that would fall under, under the title digital humanities. Um, uh, I do want to point out an article to kind of start us off here from Inside Higher Ed uh, called, entitled, The Rising Stars of Digital Humanities, which was submitted by Will Fenton on August 2nd, 2017, not too long ago. And in the article, um, Will presents a number of folks who are considered now experts um, in the digital humanities that come out of Amherst College, Columbia University, Georgia Tech, um, and the University of California. And um, it's really impressive, um, the work that they're doing. And most of them are working at larger institutions that have a sort of a different funding structure um, than we do at Mount St. Mary College. So I don't necessarily want to talk about us in, in that same vein, but I wanted to present um, you know, some of the good work that they've been doing in case anyone wanted to do a Google search. Um, what the article points out is that their work asks us to think about the constructions of how race, gender, literature, class, sexuality, nation building, representations of people, um, cultural archives all come together digitally. Um, and again, that's sort of big, big stuff, right? It's not necessarily um, what we're doing yet at the Mount, but it's big and it's important important to note some of the contributions of the folks that are, are doing some really interesting and important work out there. Um, some other colleges that are um, doing things like visualization or data design or gaming or coding are uh, Stanford University or Berkeley, um, MIT, and in fact, MIT is doing some really interesting work with virtual reconstruction. And Duke University has a really great library guide on uh, defining what digital humanities is. And UC UCLA has um, a really um, interesting bent on things in terms of how to facilitate group work online. And um, UCLA, I think what they're doing with how to facilitate group work online is a little bit closer to what we're doing here, which brings me back to the title of Digital Humanities and Teaching Online. This very well could have been titled simply Teaching the Humanities Online. I'm not quite sure. Maybe we're at the, at the point where we're doing um, quite you know, that extensive work, but we are 
doing the humanities online. We are teaching the humanities online as representation through Kaylin and Nihal's work. So there was a book that came out uh, in July of 2016, and the title of it is Teaching with Technology, Using Digital Humanities to Engage Student Learning. And I think that's a little bit closer to what we're doing here with a focus on engagement of student learning. And that was by Meredith. Warren, if you want to um, look that up. And what she focused on was a course called Ancient Christianity and the Church. And what she did was she looked at um, both ancient texts and images and um, how they kind of, kind of come together with some modern sources. And instead of simply showing the images in a face-to-face -face classroom, she does some interesting work with putting it online and having students work with different uh, databases um, and, and digi digital representations of images. And so, um, the, the point I want to make here is, you know, how do we take the theory of um, digital humanities and make it practical, um, and, and how do institutions kind of do that in practical terms that fit their culture? And I think what we're doing here is some interesting work with images and music in both Kalen and Nihal's um, courses. So I wanted to give that overview for a reason, because now I have some sort of pointed questions that will kind of... Um, lead us, um, you know, into into this actual discussion. So, um, so, so let me ask these questions to to both you, uh, Kaylin and Nihal, and and maybe you can go first, Kaylin, and Nihal can go second. Um, what I would like to know, I think, what we would all like to know, because you've you've been teaching online for a while, Kaylin, is um, when you think about your teaching of American music or jazz appreciation. Um, how did moving it online uh, from a face-to-face -face environment change things um, for your class? And how does the online environment actually support multimedia, um, music, images, perhaps in ways that the face-to-face -face classroom can't? If you could maybe talk about that a little bit. OK. Um, well, I've been teaching online since 2003, and I started with the first course management system, so I started with something called WebCT, and since then I've used other course management systems like Moodle and eClass, which we now use. I've also taught in Angel and Blackboard, which are other systems from other colleges, and I think, um, first of all, you have to think about the course management system that you're using, because some of the older systems didn't have a live meeting area or a way to have a live chat built into the course system. So that was, um, well, <laughs> it was it was difficult. And I think that using the more modern systems are a lot easier because you have more options. Um, so if you do want to have a group chat or if you do want to do something like this webinar where we can all listen to the same thing at the same time or we can all um, look at the same images at the same time or a video or something and then we can have a chat about it then you know that's possible and I think that my my courses have also evolved because my first online version of my intro class had a physical textbook and a CD set and that's now evolved into having an ebook and mp3 downloads and those are a lot easier for students to access, and in WebCT there was no way to even upload audio files. So I think those things, those things help a lot. And now I'm to a point where students can go online and link maybe something from YouTube, something that they heard, or um, articles that they read, and they can share them with the class in the discussion very easily or even instantaneously if we're if we're all together yeah and I just want to f ask one one follow-up question connected to that so when you think back to your face-to-face -face course where you were engaging students in music um, how does how is it different online engaging them with music online compared to when the course was face-to-face -face? I think the biggest difference that I see is that somehow in a face-to-face -face classroom, um, students 
were hesitant to voice their opinions on music. And I think it was harder for them maybe to kind of absorb it all and process it all. And maybe they didn't want to offend people in the room or something, but um, it's so much easier online if you give them the time that they need to, you know, absorb and gather their thoughts and, and then be able to use those in discussions. So I would say that our discussions are much more um, valuable, I think, online, <laughs> instead of having to just instantly kind of give feedback and um, you haven't had a chance to really, you know, research anything on it or read anything extra, you know, from an outside source on it or something before before you're commenting. So for me, discussions are are great for online courses. Nihal, I'll, I'll sort of re-ask the question again um, for you. Uh, when you're thinking about teaching your digital photography course, how does the online environment help support the kinds of things that you're doing with images um, that maybe the face-to-face -face classroom can't? Uh, well, um, let uh, let me just take a step back. Uh, the uh, the idea of teaching for me is to transfer my knowledge and uh, uh, experience to the students. Uh, so that's the uh, most important thing. And what online uh, teaching or the online facility uh, facilitates me to uh, do is to uh, let me just echo um, uh, or reiterate what um, uh, Kaylin just said that it gives uh, us the opportunity to post the information um, share information and uh, the students have more time in the privacy of their home or whenever they have the time to go through the information, uh, digest it, and participate in a discussion, and they are not intimidated by being uh, uh, un being under pressure in the classroom to give an answer within a given uh, 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 in a second, uh, a couple of minutes or so. So they can um, uh, so that uh, in that sense, it's a big help for the students. Um, um, uh, does that answer the question you asked, uh, uh, Kristen? And yeah, uh, for... certainly yes. Um, what I what I want to kind of go ahead. And uh, and also the, the this day and age uh, uh, with reference to photography. To, uh, it's digital photography that uh, uh, most uh, students come to learn, uh, at least in my class. And compared to compared to the photography, the analog photography we did in the past, so it's uh, um, uh, being able to uh, take your photographs, download them, and um, embed information. Uh, uh, that's inform uh, that's important, like the name of the photographer, where the photograph was taken, when, under what circumstances, etc. Embed that information in a digital file uh, is part of that, and so um, having uh, uh, doing the work uh, uh, or downloading, uh, uploading the images so that I can see them, and then uh, uh, verify if the information uh, that's required is embedded in the files. Uh, so all, all those things are important. And so I can give the students feedback. I, I can uh, get students who are not very good with that, uh, who don't have that kind of capabilities to, to work on those capabilities uh, uh, and enhance the quality of their work. So uh, for the most part, uh, um, if you take photographs, if you work as a commercial photographer, you need to share your uh, the, the work that you do uh, with a newspaper or a magazine or show the uh, information uh, or the photo, your photographs with the necessary information. So in that sense, um, the online uh, uh, teaching or the online sharing of information that I do uh, plays an important role. And I remember, Nihal, you and I have had 
several conversations about your course, and I remember you saying um, that if if students are thinking about getting into photography, it's important for them to understand deadlines. And uh, when they're submitting things to you online, they certainly have a deadline and there's some accountability there, which is an important sort of soft skill to learn for students. Um, and when I also think about your course when you were first developing it, Nihal, um, I remember you taking a PowerPoint and deciding to put some of the images um, from your PowerPoint onto the learning management system and create sort of an electronic book for students to go through. Could you talk about that a little bit? That was a really cool um, transfer of information from your face-to-face -face course to online. Well, uh, that, let me start by saying I, I use uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, uh, to cover uh, especially the first four chapters in the uh, book that I use for my class, The History of Photography. The first four years, uh, uh, the, the first four chapters actually um, tend to be very technical, uh, the, uh, how the pioneer uh, the pioneers, uh, uh, with uh, how they experimented, so uh, with what they experimented, that could be quite taxing for some of the students uh, and boring, quite boring, uh, to say the least. So what I have done is I have taken that information, broken it down, and uh, presented it using PowerPoint. And uh, Having spoken to the students in my history of photography class, everybody seems to be okay with it. They seem to understand it a lot better than uh, going through the, uh, the, the, the re reading through the first four chapters. But it's mandatory that they have to read the four chapters, but uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation is there just to facilitate and make it easier for them. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's a big help. Uh, and uh, uh, the re uh, I think uh, I see uh, Billy had written the year I, I had made a reference to year 1839 when uh, uh, that's the year uh, uh, we go as the year that photography was uh, discovered or founded um, uh, prior to that people did uh, experiment uh, with various uh, uh, using various chemicals and that part could be very uh, not so interesting for the students, so that's one of the reasons why uh, I just uh, decided to put everything, the information in a PowerPoint presentation. So that, yeah, uh, and uh, thank you for, for outlining that, Nihal. Yeah, I remember a time when you also took some of the images from your PowerPoint and you put them onto our learning management system electronically. And um, I remember you providing the images and the text, and it was an easier way for students to kind of sift through some of those images. Um, and you know, I think one of the benefits of, of online teaching in terms of images is that students have longer time to spend with those images when things are electronic. Um, you know, sometimes in the classroom when you're giving a PowerPoint presentation, if it's not made available afterwards, right? Students then have to remember the image they may have seen. Um, and try to recollect, but you know, putting an image, you know, uh, digitally available um, allows them to spend more time with it, um, which I think think is important. And I would say the same thing for music classes too, right? Um, you know, long gone are the days 20 years ago of listening to music in the classroom. I, mean, I remember taking a graduate course in Latin music, uh, Latino music, um, specifically of South America, and sitting there listening to it in the classroom. Well, now, you know, with, with things being available through MP3 or YouTube or other digital sources, you know, you can listen any time, right? You can listen in your car, you can listen on your mobile device. That certainly has opened up opportunities for students that they didn't have before. Um, Kaylin, um, if I switch back to you for a minute, I remember there was a time where you, you had briefly mentioned it earlier, uh, where you were offering a CD set, um, and you have found ways of sort of um, transferring that online, which I, which I think is, um, is pretty cool. Um, 
So I wanted to ask you both, maybe as a last question, and then we can kind of open it up to anything else you want to talk about. And I apologize again for this time lag. It really has kind of um, um, put a kind of damper on this webinar. But um, do either one of you have students produce their own work? So I know, Kaylin, you teach you know, an introductory music course in American music and jazz appreciation. Do you ever have students creating their own music? Have you ever thought about it before? And I know, Kaylin, you're in a graduate program uh, g getting your, your doctoral degree. Um, and I wonder if you ever thought in the future, if you continue to teach, will you have students produce their own music and submit it to you online? I think that's a cool concept. So that would be my question for you, Kaylin, and I'll open it up in a second. And then Nihal, the same question, students as producers of work, do you have students submit images to you? And I think the answer is yes, because we've talked about it before. But I'd be interested to hear from both of you how students um, contribute to their learning by producing images and producing music, or if you've ever thought about that before. Kaylin, do you want to start? The MP3s are available now, because there were a lot of problems with getting a textbook that had, you know, that was a bundle, <laughs> actually came with the CDs. And then students would order the bundle or think they were ordering the bundle and only the textbook would come. And so it's kind of a nightmare. So the MP3s are a lot more convenient. And even if they don't buy the MP3s now and they just get the textbook, um, they can get all these excerpts mostly on YouTube. So um, especially with the medieval and renaissance excerpts that they listen to, I usually make a YouTube list um, of YouTube links that I put in the course in case their MP3s um, have, you know, a troubleshooting <laughs> issue or something, or if they just don't have the access to the MP3s, so they use those. And I also wanted to respond to what you said about that, you know, people can listen on their own time and um, absolutely. When I when I was in the conservatory in music school, we you know had listening labs and we all sat around and listened together. But we didn't have a discussion after that. It was just made to make sure that we knew all this repertoire. And I think now a benefit in the online instruction is that students can listen to these pieces on their own. But then you know eight times out of ten they'll come back and they'll say. I didn't think I was going to like this, but I really liked it. And what else can I listen to that's like this? And then I can make suggestions. And also at the same time, some students will say, um, I found this piece, you know, maybe it's by a different composer or by like a related composer or someone in the same time period or something like that. And then they'll share with each other. And that would never happen, you know, in a listening lab situation. So I think that's also an improvement. And Let's see, then do, do students produce their own work? Yes, in my classes they um, can make a project at the end, especially for um, the rock and roll project. I think that's the most popular one. But they do them also for American and jazz. They can pick a certain um, composer or figure, um, performer or something like that that they liked or a certain time period. But I mean, the idea is for them, it's kind of a loose ended <laughs> project, but the idea is for them to just be able to kind of show what they've learned in the course and be able to put some ideas together and maybe um, think about uh, future, you know, the, the way that the future of music is headed and how that connects to the past history, but they do. Um, they tend to make, love to make videos. <laughs> and in the history of rock and roll class, they've been um, very creative in trying to um, ask their friends or parents or neighbors or something to, you know, um, pretend to be artists that they're um, that they're interviewing and they have a lot of fun like that. They do mashups um, of different songs, which are generally hysterical. And it just shows that they're really having fun um, being able to create things. So they are not writing their own music, but they're using what they've learned and kind of fusing it together. And as for um, me doing with the doctorate work. Um, I'm not sure. We 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 don't write our own um, pieces, but we're 
Definitely reading a lot of scholarly, scholarly articles and in the same sense, putting a lot of um, historical ideas together and then trying to write um, original thought and trying to think about how we can contribute to the future of the genre. And, and before we move to Nihal, thank you, I wanted to ask, have you ever recorded yourself playing the flute? Some, some of my students ask me, and I, I can send them um, recordings or something like that. But uh, generally, the amount, they, they, if they want to hear me, they can um, usually come to the choir concert, um, and w of which I have played the flute on um, several occasions. <laughs> Okay, Nihal, so um, yeah, talking about students as producers, do you have students submit um, images to you? And I think we talked about that before they do. Um, and how important is that, is that for students to produce their own work um, when you're talking about digital photography? Uh, well, uh, the idea of the class, my class, is for them to be able to produce their own work. So that's like the final goal. Uh, so everything we, uh, that we do, our assignments, our the training that we go through for the students is geared towards that end goal uh, to make them good uh, photographers. And uh, if uh, because uh, some of my students, um, they go on to study photography or they are part of uh, uh, Dean Goldberg's um, multimedia uh, production class. S um, and the others have, uh, uh, they, are, they want to be accountants or nurses, um, teachers. So if you, or your end goal, uh, uh, goal is to be uh, in the field of photography, work as a videographer or producer, uh, then my class is, uh, is mandatory that you learn to produce work that uh, people will pay to buy, um, pay and buy. Uh, so um, as for with reference to the students who major in accounting or nursing, uh, what I tell them is that the dynamics of professional photography has changed uh, compared to 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, today, um, photography is treated as a transferable skill. A nurse or an accountant or a, a, a junior a manager might be uh, called upon to photograph uh, uh, something and present it as a PowerPoint presentation or any other presentation um, at, a, at a seminar. So good photography uh, become, uh, becomes very important. Uh, so all my students, um, I uh, stress the importance of good photography, good clear photography uh, that can um, uh, se send a strong message. So with that in mind, it becomes uh, easier uh, for me uh, to say, okay, this is your final goal, and if you photograph well, if you take good photographs, um, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, reach your goal uh, uh, with, uh, successfully. Um, and for as far as um, um, I, I think that's it. <laughs> And then that's the answer uh, to your question, okay, Kristen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think too, it's it is an important skill set. I know that there are nurses uh, here at the college, nursing students that um, are going to be working in environments in the future where things are going to become more more electronic. I mean, I even went to the doctor myself the other day and was astounded by, you know, that they can send me text messages now of, um, you know, procedures I've had, um, results. Um, and it, certainly they're going to be working in environments where maybe sharing images are important. Of course, there's HIPAA laws for medical professionals, but, you know, sharing images of cuts and scrapes or things like that is something certainly um, in the future that they could be doing. Um, so. 
thank you both for for sharing some insights, you know, into your own course. And I guess I'll I'll leave us with um, going back to uh, one of the articles that I mentioned earlier, and then open this conversation up a little bit to take us into the end. So the article I referenced earlier from Inside Higher Ed called The Rising Stars of Digital Humanities um, says that the digital humanities have supported a remarkable diversity of teaching, scholarship, and service uh, pursued by a diverse group of leaders who are shaping the field. Um, both from a values-based point of view and priorities. And although um, the Mount is not doing what maybe the University of California or Amherst College is doing, I think we are in do doing really important work in the area of um, music and art um, and philosophy and, and moving those things to an online electronic environment. And so I'll kind of leave us with that and open it up if there's anything additional um, that you that you want to talk about uh, more before we kind of move to, to the end of the webinar. Is there anything additional you would like to, to add to the, the concept of digital humanities for the future? Uh, Christian, if I may say something, uh, uh, this is with uh, reference to my uh, history of photography class. I'm uh, teaching that class, there are enormous amount of uh, resources that uh, students have access to. For example, the Library of Congress, because we discuss uh, the Civil War, uh, uh, 1861 to 1864, and uh, the photographers uh, who photographed the Civil War. All those images are available for the students to go to the Library of, uh, Library of Congress uh, website, uh, download. We discuss those images. Sometimes students have to analyze uh, the, uh, those photographs. Uh, so uh, there, there are enormous uh, amount of resources uh, uh, that are available to the students uh, uh, doing this on, online. and. Uh, through the digital media. So I just want to add that. Yeah, and, and Kaylin, did you want to add to that? Yes, I also would like to say that the Library of Congress has an amazing amount of resources for students. Um, especially in my American music and jazz classes. They've preserved so many recordings and videos. So it's, it's just really an invaluable resource for students to be able to use. And it's free. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to make regarding this topic, is there's so many open source resources that are available out there um, in music and art and literature and language. Um, you talked earlier, Kaylin, about going to a lab, um, listening to music. I remember taking Spanish class by going to a lab, but, you know, long gone are those days where now you can listen to Spanish lectures or uh, language online and they're available through you know other universities or colleges and um, I always say when I'm working with faculty to develop courses that uh, why reinvent the wheel if you don't have to right if there are other resources out there um, that you can use or students can use why not and the Library of Congress is a great example of that so um, again, you know, I, I think that there's lots that we can talk about here under the umbrella of digital humanities, and certainly we will continue to grow as an institution over the next couple years in these areas for sure. Um, but you are both doing such fantastic work, and I just wanted to thank you for sharing with us, um, not only in the live session, but also as a recording of all the great things that you're doing, and I know that you both are very open to, you know, people even asking questions. Other folks who are interested in doing online teaching, you're open to, to fielding questions, and I thank you for that. So with that, I think we can sort of wrap this up, and um, if, if folks have uh, questions for you, um, you know, we can certainly provide your email address, um, uh, you know, if they wanted to ask you 
more questions. But thank you again for your time and sharing with us. And um, I think we will uh, move to the last slide, which we already asked questions. But here's our contact information for the Office of Online Learning. Our email is onlinelearning at msmc.edu if anyone has um, additional questions about this topic. And thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, Kristen.